crumbs. <laughs> There's Brian. Mara. How's everybody doing? <laughs> These chapters seem a little more challenging. <laughs> challenging? <laughs> Sorry? No, I'm hopeful after our lecture today, things will feel, make much more sense. <laughs> so when you say that the homework was challenging, you mean chapter 12's homework? No, reading chapter Material 13. Material in chapter 13, reading it. Okay, good to know. I would agree. Definitely agree with that one. <laughs> it was a challenge <laughs> to get through it. Well, it, you slog through it, that's great. Let's see, who are we missing? Who are you, Melissa, Brian, Kimberly, Lara, Melissa? I think Kelly. Kelly, that's who we're missing. Is Sam still here anymore? No, she decided to wait and take it in the fall. Her life was a little hectic. Which I think we can all relate to. We'll give Kelly just a minute. Um, I will kind of set your mind at ease. Um, Barry Cohen loves to talk about multiple comparison corrections, which you were privy to. And it is very, it's a very, very important topic. However, he goes into a, a lot more detail than I think that you need to have like present in your brain for most of the time. You need to know what is a multiple comparison correction why you would want to do one, why and when you would want to do one. And I just want you to know the three most common ones. There are lots of different scenarios that call for specialized multiple comparison corrections, um, but I'm not gonna like, Barry Cohen just is in love with all of them. <laughs> and if you know the three main ones, um, Bonferroni, Fisher's LSD, and Tukey's HSD. I think you'll be okay. We'll touch on Chaffee's, but those are the core ones we're going to stay with. Um, it's good to have an awareness of the other ones and when they might come in handy and to know where you have a reference that you can go to. But um, by and large, you're only going to most of the time see those, I guess it's four. Bonferroni, which you learned in undergrad, Fisher's LSD, Tukey's HSD, and then Chaffee's. The pairwise comparisons um, are really easy to do in R. That's the good news. The contrast statements are actually, I think, easier in R than SPSS, so that's good news, but they do take a lot more thinking. I'm not going to get too heavy into making sure that your contrast statements are, um, what is it? Um, anyway, we'll get there. Um, we'll just, we'll, we will focus on some simpler situations. Okay. Anyone want to bring up anything with chapter 12 with the homework or comments or questions that still exist? Chapter 12, doing ANOVAs, a one-way univariate independent groups ANOVA. I just had a question on the one answer mm -hmm. on C number three, the math quiz. Yes, and it was a rounding issue. Yeah. Yeah. So it, did I email you on that one? I was emailing. No. Okay, I was trying to email everyone today. So this is chapter 12, section C, number three, mm -hmm. the math quiz specifically. The, the ANOVA p value. The ANOVA p value is 0.035. Five, when you ask for three decimal places, it's 0.03 if you ask for two decimal places. And it's because it's like 0.03, I don't know, it's like, 
it's one of those that the rounding matters. So the original way it scored it, it counted it correct if it was 0 0.03. Now it should count it correct it, whether you put 0 0.03 or 0 0.04. That, I just made that change okay. um, in between my last two clients. So you'll have to refresh your screen for that to take place in your machine. But yeah, so for 12, C, number three, for math quizzes ANOVA, the p-value could be entered as 0 0.03 or 0 0.04, because it's like right in between. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and I had a quick question. Um, oh gosh, it keeps leaving my brain. Oh, yeah. So Shapiro Wilkes tests for, no, for no, normality. When, um, you, I know you said in class Monday that we don't have to, uh, write about it in our actual probably like not in papers mm -hmm. but we should do it do you want us to like do that in the homework because I, I did specifically say for the apa to um, do that it's up to you i'm not going to mandate it for the homework i'm like not going to look for it or grade it but if you want to run shapiro wilkes for your own that would be you know a good thing i would do it separately for each Group. Right. So you, so you have, have to, to filter, filter by and, and then pull it. And so like if you have three groups, then you have to run it three times. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a pain. Yeah. And so I usually don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Most people don't do it. Um, so I'm not going to have you do it on the homework, but if you want to do it for your own practice and repetition, that would be, you can leave it in the homework. You won't get docked or anything for having it in there. Is ANOVA pretty robust against non-normal? -norm it is fairly stuff. robust. And, okay. and you have to remember, Shapiro-Wilkes is testing if the sample data is normally distributed. Right. And the assumption is that the population is normally distributed. And the reason that ANOVA is robust to violations of normality is because of the central limit theorem. If even if your population data is highly skewed or bimodal, if you have a sample size of at least 20, that usually overrides that because the the even if the distribution of the values is non-normal, the distribution of the sample means will be more normal or approximately normal. And so because of that, the normality is like the less crucial of the assumptions, as long as you have group sizes that are around 15 or 20 in that range. So that's the reason we usually don't get too worked up about it. It's not that it's not important, it's just that it's one of the lesser important things that if you have group sizes that are at least 12 to 30-ish range, you don't have to be concerned. Because <clears throat> usually it's not that it's bimodal or crazy distribution, it's just usually that the population is slightly skewed. And if it's only slightly skewed, your group sizes only need to be like eight or 10. So usually if we have power, if we're powered to detect an effect, we're powered to override the, the central limit there and kicks in. That's a good point, Kimberly. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I just have a quick question. And if nobody else has this question, then <laughs> I'll have to address it now. But I'm still having a hard time like committing to memory how to do APA results or like figuring out the flow of that. Is anybody else struggling with this? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, so if we had time, I was just gonna ask if we could go like do an yeah, example. Yeah, I've been thinking, and I was putting this off till we got done because I just don't know when I'm gonna have time, um, putting together like a little booklet that has example syntax, example APA write-up um, document. I don't think I'm gonna have time to do that for you guys. That's the bad news. I will be putting it on the encyclopedia, like everything I do. But um, there is, let's see, if, do I have it in Canvas right now? Um, am I sharing my screen with you guys? Did I get that no. shared? No, let me share my screen. Okay. So let me go to Canvas. Um, oh, it's going to be in files, so you don't have access to the files. Let me see if it's here, and then I'll give you a, a link to it if it's here. Um, I oh, is it here? No, it won't be there. Um, I'm not giving you guys access to the files because the figures that are on the exam are in here, and so I don't want those floating around, especially before the exam goes out and then for after, so that's why I don't have that available to you right 
let's see in the readings. So there is kind of, is this the document? No, that's not it. Yeah, so there is a research uh, resource. Where is it? That is, that's not it. I have, I have like, it's the, I hesitate because it's an older version of APA, it, but um, let's see, where is it? I think it's this one. Um, APA stuff. So this is, does it say, so this is 2014. Um, so not tons of stuff has changed, but it has, what's nice is it um, has, where is it right here? It has some sentences that are written out for different tests and different sample tables. Let me take that and make that available on Canvas. That'd be really helpful, thank you. Um, let me see. I used to make it mandatory that you read these, but it's just hard to make everything mandatory. So, yeah, this has some information. I think that that Wilk the or this Wendorf is really helpful. So let me let's see. Let me do it on the home page so we can't lose it. So if I come down here. And I can link, let's see, I put it in readings, I believe. There. So at least there's this, there's that PDF document that has some examples. Um, like here it says how mean, standard deviation, Cohen's D, correlation. So it does say we're supposed to do degrees of freedom in there. Eta squared, confidence intervals for mean and mean difference, T values, F values, and then it has some sentences. Okay. So one sample t-test. Now these, this is not like a full write-up of methods and results, but it's like a one sentence encapsulation. So here we did a one-way ANOVA showed that the difference in quiz scores between the control group and the first experimental group and the second experimental group were statistically significant. And where you would put, so if you're using N for the, little n for the sample size, capital M for the mean and capital SD for the standard deviation, those things go in parentheses, but the F value, the P value and effect size go at the end of the sentence with just a comma separating it. Okay. Is that the kind of APA questions you're having? Or is yeah. It more I mean, also, I'm just not always sure, like, how much information to include for, like, the methods and how much information to include for the results. Yeah, um, and this is, this is something that I still struggle with because we're always in, I'm mostly functioning in publication, like, writing publication manuscripts, and we are always so short we only have this much space and, and the co-authors are like, you can have three lines to write about the methods of the analysis. You know, we're like always trying to trim words wherever we can. And um, you want to include everything so that if you were to hand someone their data, your data set, they could run it and get the exact same numbers as you did just based on your words. Hmm. So you need to tell them, which variables were your independent variables, which ones were your dependent variable, what method you used, um, any of the options. The, like when we did the two sample t-test, did we assume equal variance or not assume, assume, assume equal variance and why? Because we ran a Levine's test. Okay. So you need to give them enough of the details so that they could reproduce your results if they were given your data set. 
So for the purposes of this class, it would be best for us to practice putting out like all of the information and then learning to trim. Yes, so I would, yeah, so that's why I said put in the part about checking for normality within each group and checking homogeneity of variance with Levine's test. Usually those things get cut in the editing process, but right. I want you to, because that's the focus of this class. Right. And in, a, in a dissertation, your committee would really like to see it. Okay. In both cases. Because it's kind of that bridge between learning and publication, from classroom to publication. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So Melissa, Melissa, it was you, right? You sent me a paragraph that you wrote for that one, 12C number three. She sent uh -huh. me a paragraph and said, this is what I wrote. And then I emailed her back with some edits to it. It was very well done, but I had one edit. When you say you did Levine's test, make sure to say, whether it supported homogeneity variance or found violations to homogeneity variance. It's good that you say you did it, but also tell you what it means. So, and there's sometimes, sometimes the wording can be, I'm not too concerned with the, like perfecting the wording to flow really smoothly. It can be kind of choppy because this is your first time, but try to give it a couple goes. But if you are really not sure, you can email me and I will send you some feedback on it, definitely. So on a lot of the um, Canvas assignments, I've had kind of that, and on the test, the last test, I had like those two boxes. This is the stuff that bu bullet points for the methods. These are the bullet points for the results. If you kind of check those off, you're good. Now in a paper format, you're gonna have a whole paragraph on who the subjects are and how you recruited them. You're gonna have a whole paragraph on each measurement tool. So you'll have a whole, thing about how you got them to rate their phobia. So that part, it's, that background information should be very condensed for our class where that would be a lot bigger component for um, a manuscript. We don't just say, we have a phobia rating. Well, <laughs> but that's not the focus of this class. The focus of this class is the actual statistical method and the statistical results. Okay. So usually in the methods section, you'll have a subsection for participants and then for like each thing that you measured, phobia, heart rate, math quiz, stat quiz. And then in, then the last one is usually statistical analysis. Okay. And so we're kind of doing the methods statistical analysis part. Okay. And then the results are usually all statistical analysis results. And then after that, you have your discussion, which is, all the implications and the takeaway and and then the limitations. Okay, awesome. I will probably email you an example of one of my answers just to make sure I'm on the right track. Yep, so office hours and email and I can give you kind of some feedback because okay. by the time I get these graded it's too late. Right, right. So I would rather use my time to do more office hours with you guys than to do more after the test grading. Right. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Any other chapter 12? The good news is we're still doing ANOVAS today. We're going to be doing ANOVAS for another two weeks. That's good, right? So let's see if I can figure out, I don't know the best way to do this because if I make this full screen, then when it records it, it puts your pictures out to the side and it makes the screen smaller. We'll try it. We'll try it. Okay. So, so far we've done an ANOVA method. We've done the one way independent groups, univariate ANOVA. This is an omnibus or an overall test to say, do any of the groups differ? At least one group differs. So if you get a significant F value, if the F value has a tiny P value, how tiny? Smaller than 0.05, then that indicates at least one of the groups differ. So the purpose of our multiple comparisons, our post hoc tests are to find out which of the groups differ group or groups differ. So there are two main types of comparisons you can make. 
There's simple comparisons and complex comparisons, and we're going to go over both. The simple comparison is when we compare two group averages. So it, often it's called a pairwise comparison. So pairwise comparison, you're comparing group one with group two, group two with group three, group one with group four. There are only two groups being compared. And this is done with a t-test. We know about t-tests, but it's done a little differently than the t-test we did before. A complex comparison is where you're making a comparison involving more than two groups. So it might be comparing low and medium to high and impossible. We're still going to lump them into two groups, but we're going to have more than two groups. So if we just did low versus high, that's a pairwise. But if we did low and medium versus high, that's a complex comparison. We might have more than two groups being compared. So this, um, this is usually the way we proceed is first we do the ANOVA and only if it's significant do we move on to the multiple comparisons procedures. That is the most common procedure. We don't do these pairwise tests or com complex comparisons unless the F value is first significant. There are a couple times when we will overrule the significant F value, we'll ignore a non-significant F value and move into doing multiple comparisons. And usually it's when our assumptions are violated or our type two error is not such a concern or if it's been um, previously postulated to do a, a multiple comparison. And that's the only time that we can override its non-significant p-value. Generally, it is accepted, it's okay to do multiple comparisons as long as your p-value is close to significant. So when do we usually say a p-value is significant? When it's? 0.05 or less. 0.05 or less. So the F value should be less than 0.05 to move forward. If it's close, like it's 0.06 or 0.07, we're usually okay to move to multiple comparisons. So if it's just close to significance, we're a little bit more lenient there. So this is one of my favorite comics. I have this on my wall of comics and memes. So the girl comes running in, she says, jelly beans cause acne. Scientists, investigate. And so they found no link between those that do and don't eat jelly beans and those that get acne. P is bigger than 0.05. End of discussion, right? Well, he says, well, that seems like it's done. But she says, I hear it's only a certain color that causes acne. So they go back to the drawing board. And then we have all these little comics in the middle. First, they check purple, those that do eat purple, those that don't eat purple. Then they check brown, pink, blue, teal, on and on all the different colors. How many colors did they check? Twenty. Twenty. What are the p-values? There's one that says less than 0.05. One of the 20 is less than 0.05. How much faith do you have that it's really green jelly beans that cause the problem? You never know. You never can know for sure. But if you did 20 tests, how many would you expect by random chance to pop up significant? Just by random chance. What's our false positive rate? 0.05, isn't it? 0.05, our alpha. If we're using alpha equals 0.05 to make our decision, then realistically our false positive rate is 5%. So e even if jelly beans do nothing, 5% or 1 in 10, 20 tests will be flagged as significant just by random chance alone. So this is the problem with doing post hoc pairwise and comparison tests after you do ANOVAs. 
is when you are doing a lot of tests, you are likely to get some false positives. And we want to ensure that if we are saying something significant, it really is, and we want to correct for the situation where we are, are actually doing lots of tests. So hopefully we do not publish. Now this is a big problem in general. This is part of the reproducibility and transparency problem in social sciences that some people are calling a crisis. Up to, studies have shown that up to 75 to 80% of published research cannot be replicated. That's a problem. And it's one of the speculated sources of that problem is that researchers are doing lots of statistical tests and only publishing the ones that pop up significant. Now, that could be a publication bias problem, that could be people um, faking the data, it could be, um, a lot of different reasons, but um, one of the problems, one of the sources of non-replicability is doing a lot of different tests and not being transparent that you did a bunch of tests and not accurately accounting for the fact that you did a lot of tests. Now, there are no stat police sitting in your office counting how many tests you're doing. It's part of being a professional that you are, don't lie about this kind of thing. So when we do post hoc or follow up tests to an ANOVA, we need to make sure that we know how many we're doing, we report how many we're doing, and we accurately correct for the number that we're doing. So alpha, that's where we're going to cut our p-value, whether it's 0.01, 0.05, or 0.10, that transfers into our false positive rate. And that's the false pa positive rate for each test. So here it has an alpha with a little PC. That's per comparison. So for if each test, per test, we have an alpha. Now, if alpha, we set at 0.05, but what if we do two tests? What's our overall false positive rate? False positive rate here is 0.05 and here is 0.05. What's our overall false positive? Now, you have to do this little formula, formula here in the green. You do 1 minus 0.05 is 0.95, and we would square it if we're doing two comparisons, and then subtract it from 1 to get our false positive rate. Someone have a calculator handy? So what if we use alpha equals 0.05 for each, per comparison for each test? So 1 minus 0.05, and let's square that because we're doing if we're going to do two tests and then subtract it from one. So if I do two tests, each with alpha 0.05, so the per comparison rate is 0.05, the overall rate is, did anyone do that with me on the calculator? Is it Almost 10%. Yeah. Let's do it for, tw what if we did 20 tests? 1 minus 0.05, and now raise that to the 20th power, and subtract that from 1. If I'm doing 20 tests, what's my false positive rate now? 64%. That's crazy. 64%. Who feels comfortable with a false positive rate of 64%? This is the problem of multiple comparisons. Even if you're using alpha 0.05 for each test, conglomerated and 20 of them together, now you're up to 64%. That's not ignorable. So we need to have a way to keep that in check. Now, if we're doing an ANOVA with four groups, if you have four groups, you could do one compared to two, one compared to three, one compared to four, two to three, two to four, and three to four. There are six different ways you could compare four groups. There are six different pairings. They're shown in this green box. So if we have six comparisons and we use alpha 0.05 for each, what would that make our, if we use that formula, 
0.95 to the power of six. That means totally together we would have 26% error rate. That's a one in four chance of being false positive when we're comparing four groups. That's way too high. So here are our options. And the different methods take different approaches to these options. Option number one is we can ignore the problem. Bury our head in the sand. That is an option. People do it every day. I want you to know better. Option number two is we can change our per comparison alpha rate. Instead of using alpha 0.05 for each test, we can use alpha 0.08 or alpha 0.15 or a different alpha for each test. The other third option is we could adjust our overall experiment-wide alpha level, which is usually less liked. So this middle option, modifying our per comparison alpha, is the most common approach that's taken. So some lingo here. There are, and this is again where you're going to be a professional and not lie. There are two kind, main kinds of comparisons that we talk about. There's the post hoc and there's the pre-planned a priori. So a post hoc comparison is one we do posterior or after the fact, where we have no preconceived notions. After we collect the data, we want to explore usually all possible comparisons. This inflates type one error rate for the whole experiment quite a bit. This is where we definitely have to do some correction. In the green box on the right side is pre-planned or a priori. This is where you select the comparisons, not all possible, but some comparisons, either one or more, but not all. We choose those comparisons before we even gather the data. So to be considered an a priori comparison, you have to write it down in the proposal before you get the data whether you're doing a dissertation, a grant, or a paper. It has to be actually written down. And this is where registered reports come in for um, keep holding researchers accountable to this because you have to state your a priori um, comparisons you're gonna make before you get your data. So if you do this green one, we justify our comparisons by planning ahead. This is the scenario where the overall ANOVA does not have to be necessarily significant to move forward with our comparisons. Post hoc have to have a significant or near significant ANOVA F test first. Pre planned do not have to have the ANOVA significant F before you can proceed. Because we are only doing a few comparisons when we pre plan, there's much less inflation of our type one error rate. Um, so this is a less problematic, especially if you only plant one comparison, then you pretty much don't have to worry. Um, sometimes we'll plan two of 12. Um, it depends on what you're researching and what your hypothesis are for your research question, whether or not you wanna go with post hoc or a priori. Sometimes we don't have enough information to generalize, gen gener generalize what our research question as far as post hoc should be, so we just wait and do all possible. None, neither of these are good or bad, they're just two options that exist. Please be transparent and truthful. Um, I know a lot of researchers aren't. So, a lot of times, People will get, they won't say either way. They'll gather their data and then they'll plot it or run the test. And after that fact, run all possible tests, pick out the ones with significant p-values and pretend like they were pre-planned. That biases your results, makes it so you're probably not gonna be able to be reproduced, your results reproduced, and um, that's not good for your career. So don't do that. Okay, so here's an example. Um, 
Okay, if we are only, if, say we have 20 pairwise comparisons that we could make. If we only plan to do one, we only have a 5% false positive rate. But if we did all of them, our false positive rate is about 100%. It's almost guaranteed. So how do we go about correcting for multiple comparisons? Here are just some of the listing of all possible ways to control for multiple comparisons. And I think I tried to get all of the ones that were in the book, plus a couple of other well-known ones. There's a lot, right? For a priori tests, most commonly we use Bonferroni and linear contrast. Sometimes we'll apply a Shafaze, but usually we don't have to worry too much about corrections when we're doing just one or two a priori tests. In the green box is the post hoc tests that truly are not planned ahead of time. And there's a much longer list. Now the reason there's so many different ones is none of them function perfectly or the, the best in all situations. And it's hard to know for sure which situation you're in sometimes. So we in this class are gonna focus on Fisher's LSD, Two keys HSD and Shafay's test, and along with the Bonferroni. Those are the only ones I'm going to expect you to know for like a test and homework situation. All of the others are um, specializations, pretty much, of those three. And Fisher's and Two keys and are about the most extreme in either direction. So all of the other ones fall somewhere in between. And because of that, I'm not going to focus too much on, on them in class unless you guys have one or two that you really would like to know more about. What did you guys think reading about all the different kinds of tests? Leah, that's quite a face. <laughs> you loved it, right? It was a little overwhelming. I yeah. feel like I understood it, but I don't remember any of it yes. at this point. So, But you know where to go and the types of things to Google about when you do come across a specialized situation. You know mm -hmm. there are options. Yeah. That's good enough for me. Okay, so Sarah, yeah. can you just briefly state which ones we do need to focus on for this class? Fisher, okay. Fisher's okay. LSD, Tukey's HSD, Shafay's, and Bonferroni. And these are all on the um, formula sheet, and we'll go over how to do all of those four in R. Okay. Okay, so okay. I won't be saying anything about the other ones unless okay. you have asked. Okay, so this is how the post hoc pairwise tests work in general. In general, this blue box T formula looks really similar to the T test we've seen before, right? It's a fraction, and on the top of the fraction, we put the two sample averages subtracted. How, excuse me, how different are the two groups? The bottom of the fraction looks similar in that we have a square root, and under the square root, we have two fractions which each have this group sample size underneath, but on top of both fractions, instead of having the standard deviations for each group, we used our estimated pooled variance. Because we used to have S1 squared and S2 squared on top of those little fractions, now we're gonna use the estimated pooled variance from the ANOVA. Now, if you have four groups and you're comparing two of them, it's important to note that that pooled variance is pooled across all groups. And that makes it more stable, but it also makes it more um, based on the assumption of homogeneity of variance. So remember, if we don't have homogeneity of variance, we really shouldn't be doing an ANOVA. There are adjustments to do. And so if you don't have homogeneity of variance, you should be doing um, just pair t-tests with the um, separate variance formula instead of doing ANOVAs. Or you should do some non-parametric alternative. So we'll start off with the easiest procedure to do on your own, um, because it is very mathematically simple. And this one's taught in undergrad stats. Does anyone remember learning about this one? Bon Peroni. Such a fun word to say, Bon Peroni. So Bon Peroni's corrections works this way. If I'm going to make six comparisons, 
I take my alpha 0.05 and I divide it by six to get my new alpha to use per each comparison. So in the example box, if I'm going to make six comparisons, six t-tests, I take 0.05. I want to keep that as my experiment-wide overall p-value. So I just chop it into six equal pieces, which is 0 0.0083. And that's the new alpha I'm going to use to determine significance for each of the pairings. Easy to do, right? Very easy to do, very, very severe. In practical application, nearly every time you do this, it will wipe out all significance. It is very, very, very overly harsh. It is taught because it's easy to do, not because it should be done very much. Okay. So you would do your so use your software, get your output as you usually would, and you do nothing except for when you look at the p-value, you have a different cutoff for determining if it's statistically significant. And you have to by hand on your calculator or phone do 0.05 divided by whatever, however many tests you're running. Okay. There is the Bonferroni is sometimes called done. Um, there are t tables with Bonferroni corrected values. We're not going to use those. Um, the takeaway with um, Bonferroni, though, is that it's so conservative. It's so harsh. It, it, you are guaranteed to have no more than 0.05 false positive rate. It totally preserves your type 1 error rate. But at the cost of power, it costs you the ability to detect true effects. So that's, it's, it's always a pro and a con. There's no such thing as a free lunch in statistics. Okay. So the next one we're going to go to is Fisher's LSD. LSD stands for least significant difference. This is also known as Fisher's protected test um, or multiple T test. This is um, the default in almost every program that I know of. And it says, and these are the blue bullets, only after we get a significant F statistic do we move forward. And then we do our T tests. It does not require you have equal groups, which is a great thing. It makes it easy because you don't, you can apply it to a lot of situations because you don't have to have equal group sizes. When we get to two keys HSD, two keys requires equal group sizes. So Fisher and Tukey were around at the same time. They did not agree on very much. They argued quite a bit. This is one of their arguments that they had was Fisher said, as long as you ensure that your F statistic is significant, you should be able to do all the pairwise comparisons you want. And you should be protected. As, and that was his logic. It's a lot more liberal than Bonferroni's. But it turns out that Fisher was right. You can do post hoc tests as long as your F statistic is significant. However, it's only recommended when you have three groups. That happens a lot though. Three groups. We only recommend doing Fisher's LSD when you have three groups. So Tukey came along and he said, um, nope. I'm going to go to this slide here. Tukey, there's this smiling face and the cute little guy. <laughs> He's pretty cute looking for a statistician anyway. So Tukey said, um, no, Fisher, you can't just do all the pair pies you want. You've got to make some correction. And so this is preferred if we have more than three groups, but the groups have to be the equal sizes. And it's based on the premise that the type one error rate is controlled for by comparing the biggest and the smallest, because those are the two most extreme means, the biggest, the highest mean and the lowest mean. And if you compare those first, that will help control. So in this one, the second bullet point, it does not require a significant F test. Fisher's does, Tukey's does not. 
The way you do it is you have to find this new value, a new table, woohoo, called the Q value. So you look up a Q critical value and you use that to adjust um, with the mean squared within from the ANOVA. It's more conservative than um, doing nothing, but it's not as extreme as doing Bonferroni. So Fisher's is the most liberal. Tukey's is nearly the most conservative. Bonferroni is the most conservative. And all the other ones fall in between Fisher's and Tukey's. So let's look at this Q table for a second, shall we? So this is um, in your book. So if you need it on a test, I'll give it to you. This is table 11 in Appendix A. So it's set up, what table does it look similar to? The arrangement. We got numbers across the top and numbers down the side. Like an F? It's like an F table. It's very similar to the F table. And like that, you have to look at the top and make sure this one says alpha 0.05. You got to make sure you're on the right page on this one, just like the F table, because it has multiple pages. Now, on the F table, we had to look degrees of freedom in the numerator, degrees of freedom in the denominator. This one, Tukey adjusted a little bit because he said number of groups, because how do you get the numerator degrees of freedom? Number of groups minus one. So he's just took that out. So you just look number of groups across the top. It says number of groups. And then down the sign, it's degrees of freedom within the denominator degrees of freedom. And you go in there and you find your critical value. Find the right column, the right row, where they line up. That's your critical value. That's the Q. And Q stands for Studentized Range Statistic. Don't ask me why he chose to call it Q. Maybe because it was less used. It's our friend Q value. So, okay, so is R K minus one? R, the degrees of freedom within? Um, no, I'm seeing this R hanging out there on the left. What does that uh, mean? R is, oh, it says R is number of groups. Yeah, okay, yeah, this is, we, what do we call, what letter do we use for number of groups? K. Hey. And now it says R. The reason is, is when we get to um, two-way ANOVAs, we have rows and columns instead of just groups. And so we start calling them R and C instead of K because we have groups for the row variable and groups for the column variable. So yeah, so if you, this is number of groups. Read the text. So if you, it could be R, it could be C, it could be K, just number of groups for the variable you're looking at, number of groups. Thanks for, I forgot that K, R was hanging out there. Number of groups. So this, if you have, okay, in this slide it has K. So K is random samples with equal N. Two keys requires equal group sizes. You want to look at the difference between the highest and the lowest at group averages. So you take the differences and you divide them by the square root of mean squared over n. And then you want to compare that to the q value from the table. So you're going to take the two averages that you're comparing and we start with the biggest and the smallest group averages and subtract them. And we divide that by mean squared within, which is mean squared error, MSE, it's printed out on our output, right? And divide it by N. Now, little n is the common group size. Again, it requires that the groups are all the same size. And then we're going to decide if it's statistically significant or not based on that Q critical value in the Q table. Now, the good news is, is 99% of the time in real life, you're gonna let the computer do this for you. Yay for R. Now, there is a way, if your group sizes are not perfectly equal in size, you can do the harmonic mean, which is averaging, but not a regular average, to, to find what you put in for little n. 
And I think there's one on the homework for chapter 13. And I think I did the harmonic mean for you because just to save time. Is there? Maybe not. I have already gone through and fixed up homework 13 for you, so it's ready to go. Um, two keys HSD is here. Two keys uh, also has a two keys B. There's the SNK, the Games Hal, the Reg WQ, the Duncan. All of those tests are based on that studentized range, that Q statistic. They're all slightly different takes on this same process. And I'm not going to go into the details about them because most of the time we don't even do them. But there are slight adjustments to this using that same Q statistic. Can I ask you another question while you're right there? I'm so yeah. sorry. No. Maybe I'm just confused. Go back. Yep, right there. So on the M, the mean squared error and MSW, are that the same is thing. take, pardon? They're the same thing. Right. So and it, I'm just trying to find a formula for it and I can't find it right now. So is it sigma squared for the first group plus sigma squared for the second group plus sigma squared for the third group and then divided by the total number of groups? Is that mm -hmm. the same? If one? the groups are the same size, yeah. Uh, only if the groups are the same size. Okay. If they're not the same size, then it does, it's the weighted mean. Oh, right. Okay. Weighted by n minus one. Okay. But if, okay. So this, okay. this would probably be a good time. I want to show you where these are, are at on the formula sheet so you don't yeah. start panicking about memorizing them. Right? <laughs> Who wants to memorize all this stuff? Okay, so here's our formula sheet. There's our t-test side. This is on the back of the t-test. So here's our effect size measures we've already looked at, G and Cohen's D. Down here are our post hoc tests. Post hoc tests are after ANOVA. So pairwise, in general, the general format for a pairwise test is to subtract two group averages. I'm going to call them group I and group J. So subtract the two averages. In general, we divide by twice the mean squared error over N. That's the general formula. Fisher's test we compare that to a T critical value. Two keys, we use Q as our critical value. And notice what's also different about two keys versus Fisher's. What happened to that number two? He That's absorbs right. that number two into the table. So the table has absorbed that. So these are the three ways to do a pairwise test without any adjustment or using Fisher's LSD and Tukey's HSD. So we will we'll be doing examples of both of these. Then, so those are the pairwise tests. The other kind is a linear contrast, which is a more complex comparison. And we're gonna learn how to do Chaffee's correction for those. So these formulas are all on our formula sheet. They will be on tests, you can use them, um, print them out, so Sarah, if they if they're not equal group sizes and we have to do the harmonic mean to get this little n. Yeah. Truly, really you should not yeah. be using two keys if you have different group sizes. And if you have different group sizes, you can do fissures and the little n should be the harmonic mean of the sample sizes. Which is what again? How do I find that? Harmonic mean. Um, did the book show you that? All I think all the examples here, I'm looking at all the examples on the homework. I think all the examples on the homework have equal group sizes, so you don't have to worry about that. And in application, the computer software will adjust that for you. It'll calculate the harmonic mean. Yeah, I just looked through all the homework has equal group sizes, so you don't need to worry. And while we're here, can anyone find the formula for MSW? Or MSW MS is this pooled standard deviation. So here it is for two groups okay. with equal group sizes. Here it's with two groups with unequal group sizes. Mm. And if we scroll down to the next page on the ANOVA table, Mean squared, here's mean squared column, and here's error. So mean squared error here is where we add up all this SI squared and divided by K. Again, that only applies if they're equal group sizes, but because little n is the cell size, as in they're all equal size. Okay. 
sweet. Okay. Oh, Tuki, so cute. Okay. If we calculate, excuse me, the HSD or the LSD, we can make confidence intervals. When we do, an easy way to do a confidence interval is um, to take our difference and add or subtract our HSD value. Our HSD value is calculated with the um, formula that was on that formula sheet. So we can add or subtract to find out a confidence interval for the difference. If the confidence interval includes zero, zero is a feasible option. You cannot reject the null hypothesis of no difference. So this is the most common way that these decisions are made with HSD. We calculate the HSD value and then we subtract each pair. And then from the subtracted value, add and subtract HSD to get a confidence interval and see if it includes zero. We need to do an example because that was a lot of talking. We'll do an example. Okay, before we get onto the examples, I wanted to point out um, Shafe. So here's Shafe. He's maybe not quite as cute as Tukey. If we're talking boyfriend material, I don't know. He was brilliant too. Shafe is, this says most conservative, least powerful. We usually only use it not when we're doing post hoc analysis. We usually use Shafe's when we're doing a priori, pre planned comparisons because we usually only have one or two. So it doesn't hurt, doesn't take too much of a hit on the power. You would not want to use Shafay's test if you were doing all possible pairwise when you had five groups. It would hit your power too much. So um, at the bottom of the slide, it says it's not recommended in most situations. We only use it in the complex post hoc comparisons, usually when they're pre-planned. Pre and we'll do an example of this. I think that's better than like trying to memorize the formula. But that formula that's on the slide is on the formula sheet. Okay, so let's let's do an example. In fact, let's let's work on the example we did yesterday or not yesterday, last time we were together. So last time we were talking about having our 15 people memorize a list of nonsense words. And they had one minute to memorize these words. And group A were in a quiet room, group B did it in the classical music, moderate noise. And then group C did it in the loud, heavy metal room. So here's our data. I've got it in long form. This is tidy data. Each person has one line. Each variable has one column. What is our dependent variable and what is our independent variable? Dependent variable is? Memorized. Memorized. It's the interval ratio score we want to compare the average as of. We want to compare the average number of wor words memorized. So memorized is our dependent variable. It'll go first in our formula. What's our independent variable? The music they were listening to. The type of music, and it has three levels. So music is our independent factor. So we're saying, does this factor, none, classical, rock, effect number of words memorized. So here's the data is in R. I've already entered it. So I can do a furniture table one to get the descriptive. So we did this on our last homework assignment. We grouped it by the grouping factor. And then we did furniture table one of the dependent variable to get a table with our averages and we can eyeball these. So we eyeball these and we say, hmm, it looks like no music has the highest average 9.2 compared to classical and rock, which both have 6.6, 6.2 words memorized. So that this step is called exploratory data analysis. We want to summarize our data to get an idea of what's going on. I can also make a plot, a box plot, Visually, visualizing and summarizing your data are both steps of exploratory data analysis that should always happen before you run your main analysis. So if we're going to run our main analysis, first we, besides normality, and we really should worry about normality here because we only have five in each group, but we'll forgo that for now. Test homogeneity of variance, so we're going to do Levine's test. When we do Levine's test, our formula has the dependent variable, tilde wave, grouping factor 
data equals dot, center equals mean. Here's the results from my Levine's test. What do these results tell me? It, based on the p-value, it doesn't look significant. It's not significant. So what does that mean? So there's a violation for homogeneous. There is a violation? Oh. No, there's no violation. No, the null hypothesis oh, yes, is nothing yes. going on. So we stay with the null hypothesis. So there's no evidence of a violation of homogeneity variance. So we're good to move forward with the ANOVA. So we move on to the ANOVA. So again, we start with our data set. Now we're going to go into the AFEX, ANOVA 4. Our formula starts the same, dependent variable, tilde wave, grouping factor. But then we have to add on this parentheses one observation per person, data equals dot. Now, when I did Levine's test, you have to add the center equals mean. You don't have to do that with the ANOVA, but we are gonna save our ANOVA as a name so we can do the dollar ANOVA to get fuller output. Now, when we get our output, do we worry about this contrast set to control sums message? Do we worry about that? Don't worry about that message. What about this intercept line? Always ignore the intercept line. So when we look at music, what does this p-value tell us? Ding, 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 ding. Statistical significance. What does that mean in this case? The group means are different. different. Does this tell us all the groups have different averages? No, at just least at least there's one. At least one group has a different average. Yay! So chapter that's chapter 12. So now that we know at least one group has a different average, we're on to how do we figure out which group? Okay. So here we go. This is the new parts. So remember I said that LS means package was obsolete now. So you can delete that. The where it says library LS means when that gives you an error. Mm -hmm. We do need the EM means package. EM means is for estimated marginal means. And this comes out of our model. So this is what it'll look like if you take the name. Now notice I'm taking the name of my model, not the data set, but the name of my model, which here I called fit AOV. And piping on the EM means package has a function also called EM means. It's redundant, I know. And then tilde wave grouping variable. You do not need to say anything about the outcome variable here, the dependent variable, just the grouping factor. And you will get some output that looks like this. Notice it has all the different kinds of music. And then for each kind of music, it has its average, the standard error, the degrees of freedom, and a confidence interval. And it tells you that by default, it's using 95% confidence intervals. So far, we haven't learned anything new, have we? Where have we seen these numbers before? 9.2, 6.6, and 6.2. Those are the group means. Those are the group means. Now I will let you know. They are identical to the group means because our groups were identical sizes. If your groups are different sizes, these estimated marginal means will not be perfectly the same as the group averages. And it has to do with type three sum of squares that we won't worry too much about it. Just, just awareness check. Okay. So this is how we do our post hoc tests. After we, we say the name of our model, our ANOVA model, we do that EM means part with the factor, the grouping factor variable name, and then we pipe on the word pairs adjust equals none. This will do no adjustments, which is essentially doing Fisher's LSD. Now we can also do it in, inside of the parentheses with pairs. We could say adjust equals Tukey, and that will do Tukey's HSD. How easy is it to do these adjustments? Pretty easy. We can also do Bonferroni adjustment. We say adjust equals Bon. 
So that's how you, in R, how you do all three of those, Fishers, Toothies, and Bonferronis, which are, those are the three options pretty much when we're doing pair, all pairwise tests. So these three syntax will all do all possible pairwise tests. They're just applying a different adjustment to the p-values. So let's look at the output. Here's Fisher's output. Now, how many groups do we have? Three, none, classical, rock. How many different pairings are there? None with classical, none with rock, classical with rock. There are three pairings of our three groups. So when we did EM means by itself, we got the groups individually. When we add on the word pairs, we get each pairing of groups. And this estimate is the estimated difference. That's the capital D bar. So what was the average for none? You guys remember? Oh, the average for none was? 9.2. 9.2, what's the average of classical? 6.6. What do you get when you subtract those? 2.6. So each of these estimated, this is the estimated difference in averages for the two groups on that row. So this first row is none and classical, so the group averages differ by 2.6 in the sample. How much do they differ by in the population? Well, our standard error, give or take, is 0.872. Notice the standard error is the same for all of these. There's our degrees of freedom, here's our T ratio, and here is our P value. These are the P values for comparing all possible pairs. Is none different than classical? Is the average, number of words memorized in the no music group different than the average number of words memorized in the classical group? Yes, statistically significant evidence of a difference. The null hypothesis would be nothing going on, the groups are the same. So this is saying evidence that the groups are different. So none and classical are different. Let's move down to the middle row. None and rock. Are they statistically significantly different? They're different as well. So none and classical are different, none and rock are different. What about classical and rock? They're not different because our p-value is not significant. And we this one's kind of almost rhetorical because you can look at those averages and, and pretty easily eyeball that, that the no music was different than classical and rock, but classical and rock are the same as each other, essentially. Now, this is what the output looks like if you put in the adjust equals two key. Does it look the same? Is the S, are the estimates the same or different? They're the same. What about the standard errors? That's same. The squared error. What about degrees of freedom? Same. Three. What about the T ratios? Same. The same. What's the only difference? P value. The only difference is the P value has been adjusted. Okay. Ready for Bonferroni? Which one has the more, the least significant p-values? Classical to rock. <laughs> Classical to rock, but which method? Fisher's, Tukey, or Bonferroni? Bonferroni has the bigger p-values. Yeah. It's really harsh. Which one has the most significance, the smallest p-values? Fisher's. Fisher's, that's the most powerful. But it's not just that we should do fissures all the time. Fissures requires, it's only suggested when you have three groups, when you're making three comparisons. Two keys is better when you have four or more, provided that they are groups that are about the same size, preferably exactly the same size. Mm -hmm. Bonferroni always works, but it's really, really harsh. So you can get a p-value that's one? Ah! Have you ever seen a p-value equaling one? 
I have not. <laughs> I have not. It's not exactly one. It rounds up to one. So when you write, put this in a paper, I would say the p-value is bigger than 0.999. Oh, uh, okay. So it's probably 0.999999, you know. Right, on. right. So it's rounded off to one. I would, yeah. Usually we don't have p-values of one. Just like, like we don't have p-values of exactly zero either. Right. Okay, so what do you think about doing these adjustments? Not too bad? As long as I don't have to do them by hand, I feel okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to, we, we have, we're about an hour down, a little more over an hour down. I hope that we'll be able to go through the rest of these slides and then start on the homework problems for the hand calculated ones. How does that sound? All right. Okay. These are the most more simpler to do cases, the pairwise. Next comes the complex comparisons. And this is probably where in the book you went, oh, right? You're like, I'm done listening. Okay. So let's, let's try to get, do we want to have a break first? Would that be good? Let's take a break first and let our brains um, breathe a second and we'll come back and do the linear contrast. Um, let's see, we got linear contrast. And then example problems, yeah, of linear contrast. And then how to do linear contrast. Yeah, linear contrast is all that we have left on the slides. And then we'll get into, use the last um, bit of class to start on homework by hand calculations. Okay, so let's, let's go, should we go like seven minutes or do we want 10 whole minutes? No preference? Okay, well, I'll see you back here in seven minutes then.
Hi, Sarah. So we use the EM means to find the confidence interval. Um, I think to do the confidence interval, you have to take the estimate plus or minus the HSD. So which one on the homework is that? No, I'm just wondering on, on your slides, um, it shows we use EM means, but I, I'm trying to figure out why. Um, this comes in handy in looking at the order of the groups for the next part. Okay. And because that that's kind of like the you have to do that before you can do pairwise tests. It's the um, intermediate step. Well, I'm trying to figure out what does it give me? Why is it that intermediate step? Because it has to get the estimated marginal means before it can find the difference in the pairs, like the software okay. has to do it. Whether or not you look at it is your own prerogative. I figured there was a reason why we did it. I just couldn't remember what you said that was. When you do any contrast by hand, you used to. So, Sarah, what does the upper CL and lower CL mean? Those are the upper and lower ends of the confidence interval. So, a confidence interval is always a lower number, comma, a cop higher number. Just okay. The range. Great. See, do we have everyone back? Not Hillary. We can, we didn't get Kelly. Do we get Kelly in here? Let's see if we can get Kelly. Oh, it doesn't doesn't have her. Okay. Keep an eye out. Okay. All right. 
Hillary's back. Okay, we're ready to go. All right, so linear contrast. These, this seems to be a little slower of a concept to build. So um, we'll just keep going over it. So before we took our break, we looked at pairwise contrast and they're looking at two of our groups at a time, just two. A pairwise is just two of your groups at a time. For the linear contrast, we're gonna look at more than two groups, but it's like a teeter-totter. You have to put them on two sides of the teeter-totter. So we're gonna still have two groups, but we might join groups together. So we might have small and medium compared to large, or we might have um, low phobia and moderate phobia compared to high phobia. We might combine, we're still gonna have two sides to, to weigh the difference, but we might combine our groups into bigger groups. And the way we do this um, is with a linear combination. A linear combination means we're gonna multiply the means by some weights and then add them up. The number we multiply each mean by is this little C letter, is the formula that's used. For the first group, we multiply it by C1. The second group, we multiply by C2. The third group, we multiply its average by C3. So the Cs are our weight that we're gonna multiply on each of the group averages. So we're gonna multiply each average by a weight and add it all up together. The weights, choosing the weights is the hard part. <laughs> you want to choose the weights so there are some requirements. The C weights have to add up, all of them have to add up to zero. They have to. Those weights, the way we choose them is so that one side of our teeter-totter comparison is positive and the other side of our teeter-totter weight is negative. And groups that are on the same side have to have the same weights. So if I'm gonna compare small and medium to large, small and medium have to have the same weight number and large has to have a, another number one side can be positive, one, the other side is going to be negative. So if I put on the small and medium side weights of plus one and plus one, what do I need to balance out a plus one and a plus one? One and one, so I need yeah. two. Yeah. So if I have one and one, the other one has to be two. If one side, if I have positive one and positive one, the other side has to be negative two. I could also have negative one, negative one, and a positive two. Now I could have weights of seven and seven, then this side would have to have a weight of negative 14, because all together it has to be zero. Groups on the same side have to have the same weight and all the weights have to balance out to zero. That's why we have some positive and some negative. So here's an example. So we had four group means. What if we have four group means and I want to compare one group one to group two and ignoring the other two groups. If I want to do pairwise comparing group one to group two, what could my weights be? If I make this weight a positive one, this weight needs to be a negative one. If I make this weight positive 0.7, this weight needs to be negative 0.7. I can make this first weight of negative five, then this one has to be a positive five. Now the way you ignore groups is you give them weights of zero. So one way I could do my weights would be positive one, negative one, zero, zero. That's one combination of weights that would let me compare the first group to the second group and ignoring the third and fourth group. And the way I would do the L value, the L value is the linear contrast value, is I would take those one, negative one, zero, and zero weights and times each group's average by the appropriate number. What do I get when I times these two averages by zero? When we times by zero, it's basically zero. So what are we left with? Group one minus group two. So that's the difference between the first two groups. That's the simplest scenario. What if I had the same four groups and I wanted to compare groups one and two, compare them to group three and four. So I'm going to 
combined groups one and two and compare them to the combined groups three and four. What should my weights be? Let's start off with the easiest number. One, then this one should be? Negative one. If they're on the same side, if they're gonna be combined, they gotta be the same one number. One and one. One and one, and then it would have to be? Negative one and negative one. Negative one. I could also, oh, I read it wrong. It says one, two, and three compared to group four. What about that one? How would I compare groups one, two, and three to four? If I went one, 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 then what would this weight need to be? Negative three. Negative three. Now the computer likes to do one third, one third, one third, and negative one, but you could do positive one, positive one, positive one, negative three. What are the rules? One side's positive, one side's negative. All together, they had a, to add up to zero. Weights on the same side are the same value. So essentially, it would do the average of these three compared to this fourth group. Okay, so here's our formula sheet. Now I put up here in red to remind you, MSW is the same thing as MSE, mean squared error, and it's the same thing as pooled variance. Those are all the same thing. So we talked about how you make a t-test in general. We're gonna do it like before. We're gonna subtract two group averages, but we're gonna divide by the standard error using that pooled variance. Fisher's LSD, we use a t-critical value to determine it. Tukey's, we use an Q critical value to determine the cutoff. These are different cutoffs to determine statistical significance. To do a complex comparison, we need to decide what are each of the group's weights, those C numbers, times each group average by its C number and add it all up. That's called our linear contrast value, that's L. You don't have to do any of these by hand on the homework. You have to decide what the C weights are and type it into R, but it's gonna calculate this for you. Then you do the sum of squared for the contrast, which, what is little n? Group size, right? That's your group size, assuming they're all the same. So you do group size times L squared, L is that linear contrast number, divided by the sum of the C weights, the contrast weights squared. And this is why it doesn't matter if you pick a third, a third, a third, and positive, negative one, or one, 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 negative three, because when you square them and divide them out here. Can we go over that one more time? I just got lost on your last equals. This last part? So you take the samples, the common sample size, group size, times it by our linear contrast value squared, and divide it by, you take all your weights, square them each and add them up. We're gonna do an example of this, so we'll walk through it. And that, from that, you make an F value. So pairwise tests are T tests, but linear contrast, we use an F test to do. An F test for the contrast is always numerator degrees of freedom one, because we're comparing two groups. They might be combined groups, but they're still two groups. One and the denominator degrees of freedom are the same denominator degrees of freedom from the ANOVA. And then we take sum of squared for the contrast divided by mean squared with it. We'll do the example step through all three of those formulas. Then to just, if we only have one a priori linear contrast, we are usually okay not to do a correction. But if we are gonna do a correction, because maybe we have multiple of these linear contrasts, we are gonna use a Chaffee's correction. And Chaffee's correction is where you take the critical value of F that we'd usually use, our critical value to determine if we're statistically significant, and you times it by K minus one. This is, today we only have done one-way ANOVAs. That's this box. The box underneath it's for two-way ANOVAs. We're not gonna do that till next week, so you can ignore that bottom box for now. Um, the formulas might make it look a little complex. Let's do the example, shall we? Um, the book tells, shows you all these fancy formulas for when you have unequal group sizes. We're, I wouldn't 
get too worried about it. Let's go back to our music groups, shall we? How many groups did we have? Three groups. So instead of doing all three possible pairwise, we might have thought ahead and say, hmm, my research question, when I'm developing my research question before I get my data, I say, I want to know if music has any effect, and if it has an effect, which music makes the difference? That's one way to postulate your research question. Have it phase one of your research question one is, is no music different than some music? And you would do no music versus moderate and loud, none versus classical and rock combined together. That's your first. And then your second one would be ignoring quiet. Is there a difference between classical and rock? That's a two stage research question. First, does any music make a difference from quiet? And after that, do the two research kinds of music make a difference? So if we run these as contrasts, let's do the first. No music versus moderate and loud. What should my contrast weights be? If I start out with one, what should my next ones be? Positive one. Negative one half. Negative one half and negative one half. Well, I don't like fractions. So let's do positive two and negative one and negative one. Shall we do that? So those are the numbers that we're going to times our averages by. And we could go negative two and a positive one and a positive one. We could have just as well done a positive two with our ones being negative. So, so does I, it matter which side is negative and positive? It does not. It does not. Okay. The only thing is difference are tests might end up being positive or negative, but it's symmetric. So actually we end up squaring our L value. So it all vanished. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. okay. So on the screen, the red values that come first are the weights. The weights are negative two, one, and one. That's one option. Then in blue, following the weights, I have the means 9.2, 6.6, and 6.2. Those are our group averages. So if we multiply that, those group averages by those weights and add it all up. In this case, we get negative 5.6. That's our linear contrast value. Now we're going to find our sum of square for the contrast. We're going to do our group size n times the L value squared divided by the sum of the C value squared. What's our little n size? Our little n. Five. Yep, Brian. Five. So we're going to go five times the 5.6 squared divided by, and we've got to add up all our C weights squared. Our C weights were negative two, one, one. What do we get when we square them? Four, one, and one. So what do we get when we add up our C weights squared? Four plus one plus one is six. six. So we're going to take five, our group size, times our L number squared over six. And we get 26.13. That's the sum of squared for the contrast. Now we make our F value. Well, if you go from the sum of squared to mean sum of squared, you divide by the degrees of freedom. A contrast statement always has two, one degree of freedom because we're comparing two combined groups. Let's see, how do I do this? One and two. Two combined groups minus, minus one is one. So it's one degree of freedom. So the sum of squared for the contrast and the mean sum of squared for the contrast are the same number. So we make our, our degrees of freedom, our degrees of freedom and our mean squared within those numbers were from our ANOVA. Remember when we, let's see, where's ANOVA? When we did this problem way back here. Ah, there we go. Well, way back here, when we were doing this problem, what's our degrees of freedom for our denominator, our degrees of freedom within? 12. 12. Now, on this, doing the dollar ANOVA, it doesn't tell us mean squared error, but it tells us sum of squared for within or squ sum of squared for residuals is 
6.80. So how do we get mean squared within? You take sum of squared divided by degrees of freedom gives you mean squared. So we take the 22.80 divided by 12, that gets us mean squared. I did. I just wanted to show you. I didn't pull those numbers out of thin air. They came from. Is that is that the mean squared w within? Mean squared w is mean squared within. It's the same thing as mean squared error. It's the same thing as pooled variance. Okay. Yeah. So what we just did the sum of sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom that gave us what? Mean squared. Just plain mean squared. Mean squared within. That's what I was wondering. Okay. So we did this L, we chose our contrast weights according to what our research question was to determine our linear contrast weight to create our sum of square for the contrast. That sum of square for the contrast ends up being the sum of square mean squared for the contrast because it's one degree of freedom because we have the combined two groups minus one. And then mean squared within, this mean squared within, that's for the whole ANOVA. And then to make our F ratio, we do the mean squared of our contrast divided by our mean squared within. So this contrast statement has a value of 13.7. How do we decide if it's statistically significant? How do we decide if any F value is statistically significant? Look up the critical. We need to look up the critical value. Um, I did, and it's significant. I uh, can you trust me on that? Thirteen point seven five is pretty big. It's significant. Um, oh, it's right here. It's four point seven five is what it would need to be significant. Four point seven five. So it is definitely statistically significant. So that answers the question, is no music different than any music? Now we want to say, ignoring the control group, are these two music conditions different than each other? What are my contrast weights going to be now? Ignoring the first group, what does its weight need to be? Zero. Zero. Then we've got the other two groups we want to compare to each other. What should their weights be? I can, they need to be the same number, but one positive, one negative. The easiest way to go is positive one, negative one. But I could do 3.7 and negative 3.7 if I wanted. Okay. So you choose your weights based on the research question. The weights get times on the group averages. That adds up to the L value. Then you take the sample size, the group size, times L squared divided by the sum of the c squareds and then you can make an f statistic again this will be done for you on the homework you don't have to do this by hand on the homework um, it'll all r will calculate all these things for you i'll show you how to put them in but we can see on this one our f was only 0 0.21 we know f's not going to be significant unless it's bigger than one so this one is not significant so this is the same answer to this answer to a similar question we said before. No music is different than music, but the two musics are not different than each other. So let's see how we would do this in R. When we were doing the pairwise test, here we did the, okay, so if we're gonna do the pairwise test, we did the name of our ANOVA model, pipe it into EM means, EM means, tilde wave grouping factor. So that those first two lines are the same. When we did all possible pairwise, we said pairs, and you can leave the parentheses empty or you can put the adjustment method. For contrast statements, instead of saying the word pairs, you say the word contrast. After you say the word contrast, you have to open some parentheses and then you have to say list. If you don't say list after that, it gets mad. I didn't write it, I wouldn't have done it this way, but we'll just go with it. So contrast, and then you can put a list of contrast statements. 
You have to say list even if you have one. Then you put some text. The quoted text is just a note for yourself. So here it's in green. It says one, none versus some, two, classical versus rock. This is a message to myself to remind myself what I'm doing here. So the none versus some is going to be my first contrast, no music versus some music. And then my next second contrast is going to be ignoring none, classical versus rock. After you put your quoted text, you have to concatenate or combine the numbers of your weights. Now, the order of these numbers in these parentheses matters a huge, huge amount. The way to know what order to put your weights in is to run the EM means and stop there. So if you do fit, whatever your name of your fitted model is, and then EM means, EM means, tilde weight factor variable, and stop there, you'll get this printout. And Melissa, you were asking, why would we want to print that out? The main reason we would want to print this out is because it tells us the order of the factor levels. It's none is first, classical is second, third is rock. So that's the order we're supposed to put our contrast weights in. So none should go first, and then classical and rock come after that. So when we put in my weights, if I do two, and it's negative one, negative one. The order of those weights is crucial. And then we said that second contrast, we're going to ignore the none, the no music, so that gets a weight of zero. And we want to compare classical to rock, so they've got to be the same number, opposite signs. Questions on that? So do these numbers, these numbers need to be in order? order. Which the one? order across is the same order going down of the groups that came out of EM means. Okay. Now I've redone it. The first way I did it is with no adjustment. And if you had pre-planned it, you could do it that way. But if you had not pre-planned these contrast statements before you collected your data, you would need to use an adjustment. One adjustment method you can use is Bonferroni, and you just say inside that contrast parentheses, not the list parentheses, but the contrast parentheses, you say adjust equals Bon. And in a similar way, you can say adjust equals Shafe, and it will automatically do the adjustments for you. So let's see the output. So here's the first way. How many contrasts am I running? How many contrast statements? Two contrast statements. The first one, is it significant? Is it significant or not significant? Significant? No music versus either music. Significant, p-value 0.003. The second contrast statement I ran was classical versus rock, ignoring zero weight, the no music category. Is it significant? Not significant. So music is different than no music, but it doesn't matter which music, they're the same, essentially, as far as memorizing words in this scenario. Okay, let's see. What do you think is going to happen to these p-values if we do the Bonferroni adjustment? Anyone have a guess? What does Bonferroni adjustment do? So Bonferroni is the one that's the most hard to find significance on. It's gonna make it harder to find significance. So what's gonna to happen to our p-values? Are they gonna get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Let's see if you're right. Is our conclusion the same? Our p-values have changed, but does our conclusion change? No. No, our conclusion is the same. None, no music, is different than some music. But the two musics are not different. The conclusion stayed the same even using the Bonferroni adjustment. Bonferroni is harsh, but if you get significance with Bonferroni, you are awesome. Okay, and Shafes. What do you, what do you think the p-values are going to be like for, with Shafes?
How are they going to compare to bond Peroni and no adjustment? Well, they're conservative, but I don't remember if they are more conservative than Von Ferroni or not. I don't think anything's more conservative than Von Ferroni. <laughs> Chavez is going to be between doing nothing and doing Von Ferroni's. Chavez is severe, but nothing is as severe as Von Ferroni. But again, did it change our conclusion? does not, in this case, it didn't change our conclusion. Now, it's interesting, for the second contrast statement, it's less severe, but it's more severe for the first contrast statement. It's not always a guarantee one way or the other. Who loves Yusamar? Who wants to do this by hand? Not me. Yeah, okay. So trend components. Now the book talked a lot about these trend components. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them. They are something that's automatically spit out of SPSS. And I think that's why the book covers them. If you have a trend component, you should analyze it with linear regression. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. How's that for like going ad nauseum on it? So the conclusion, not all the researchers agree on the best approaches or methods, especially for multiple comparisons, but you should do something and not nothing. And the method you choose should depend on your research profession, pref preference. Do you want to be conservative or liberal? Are you doing just a first pass exploratory analysis or are you like doing a meta-analysis for the be all end all? What's the seriousness of making a type one, type two error? Do you have equal or unequal group sizes? Do you have homogeneity variance or have you violated it? There's lots of decision points that have, you have to look at to see which kind of adjustment method you're gonna do. Um, you can run pairwise and you can do complex comparisons and we've seen both. Big, big idea in blue, if it's a priori, you, before you get your data, you choose your what comparisons you're going to make. It can be more meaningful, and you have less um, problem, more less inflation in your type one error rate. So, please, um, as much as you can, when you're research writing your research proposals, try to come up with specific conclusions, not just oh, I want to explore all these differences possible. If you think it's going to happen in one direction, usually we can build a more powerful test by doing a contrast statement instead of just doing an omnibus test. So recommendation, if you're only gonna do one post hoc comparison because you planned it so, you can just do a standard t-test. If you're gonna do lots of pairwise comparisons, like all possible comparisons, either do Bonferroni, which is people will never argue, a lot of people will say, oh, do Bonferronis. But it's better if you do Fisher's LSD if you have three groups, Two keys if you have more than three groups that are equal sizes. If you've got a complex comparison, we went over the linear contrast statement by choosing those C weights. Um, the last thing about doing those contrast statements, it's better if they are orthogonal because then you don't have to do adjustments. Um, the more groups you have, the harder that's to determine. And I really urge you to seek out consultation if you go to do those because even I have to look it up every time it gets a little complex. So um, with the complex comparisons, you can do Chaffee's or Bonferroni. If you can make them orthogonal, you have more power because you don't have to do the adjustment. Let's see. Yeah. And that's the end of the slideshow. It's almost summer, well, we're not doing summer Olympics, but here's your winter Olympics comic. Were we supposed to have summer Olympics this year? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I just realized, I didn't realize that. That's yeah, 
it's been a big deal at our house because all our girls are swimmers and my oldest has a friend that was going for Olympic trials this summer. And so, yeah, it's been a big deal for us at our house. Where was it going to be? Hmm? Where was it going to be? Japan. Oh, okay. So right now they've said postponed a year. We'll see. Thanks. Is that what the decision was? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, we were on pins and needles watching it every day because they, it was a long time till they made the decision. They kept saying, no, we're going to have it. We're going to have it. We're not going to suspend um, attendees. We're, we're going to go on as planned. And it was a long time before they finally said, yeah, I guess we can't do it after all. So. Sarah, I know they're still discussing this at the school, but um, for on-campus classes, do we have any update for fall? Okay, all I can tell all I can tell you is as much as I know, and that is, there will be on-campus classes, there will be social distancing, masks will be mandatory. Um, I've heard um, as of Monday was the last meeting that I was in that they will be providing, and maybe, I don't know if this is staff only, I'm guessing it's students, they'll provide two masks per person. Beyond that, you have to purchase more. Um, yeah, so it's just for staff. Is it just staff? Yeah. I can't imagine they wouldn't for students. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on the student side, but I do know, I know the two masks per is for staff. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, almost guaranteed it's gonna be students too. I just don't have the particulars. Um, there will be, they're still, I think, trying to work out some classes will be broadcast, the large sections, how they're going to divide them up. Kimberly, have you heard more on that? Yeah, uh, you, you're right on. You, you're exactly where I'm at and what Brian said. Um, I, I just, like, for my large lecture sections, I have to divide them up into what groups come for the live lecture and then it gets recorded and then then the rest of the class is to watch that then you know what i mean like so they have different days they come live and the other days they yeah so that's one way for the class i'm teaching this fall i'm teaching multi-level modeling which comes after regression it's not mandatory for very many programs but it's a really important class i think of course i'm biased but what's uh, the number for that shit sarah what? what's your what's the call number for multi-level modeling sorry to interrupt it's psychology 7650 it's only psychology 7650. It's not cross references education 7650, but anyone on campus can take it. Um, the prerequisite is just regre is regression 7610. But um, that class I usually have under 20, sometimes under a dozen. So it's per they've told um, Sean's told me that I can pr pretty much guarantee I can have it on campus, but we don't know what kind of classroom I'll have it on in. Um, and I might do I don't know. Every week there's something different. So, so okay. yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Um, as we were as also told that like, just to be prepared to go online at any time. Yeah, because if it comes, because a big thing they're trying to determine is um, testing policy and procedure. So it's not if, it's when someone tests positive, what are we gonna do? You know, so if you're in a class and someone who's been in your class tests positives, your class might move all online at that point or on right. broadcast. So, and if like, if I'm teaching multiple classes as an instructor, if someone in any of my classes is positive, then all of my classes, because then I have to quarantine for two weeks as right. the instructor. So it will be interesting. Cool. Sounds like everything else right now, just up in the air. I know. My kids keep looking at me like, aren't you supposed to know more, mom? <laughs> so if they have you quarantined, does everything just go online then for that two weeks? Um, I don't know if it'll be broadcast live or have to be recorded and posted. I don't know. They're trying to determine all these things right now. Nobody has any prior experience. Yeah. But as far as I know, we're not changing start and end dates to the calendar like some universities. Some are starting two weeks early so they can be done at Thanksgiving. Others are starting two weeks later so that they delay coming back to campus. As far as I know, they haven't talked about that here in any realistic fashion. That'd be cool to be done by Thanksgiving. 
the idea is they don't want people going home for Thanksgiving and then coming back with new germs. Right, right. But, don't know. Okay. Well, we have like 45 minutes to work together. Oh, could we please do all the hand ones? That would be fabulous. <laughs> I agree. Not as much, there's not nearly as much hand calculations for chapter 13 as there was chapter 14. I will definitely say that. Chap the next chapter, next Monday, there is some hand calculations again, but only on like one or two. No. Chapter 12 was the worst for hand calculations. Yeah. Let me shrink up your pictures. Will you remind me while you're doing this, like when to when to use Shafay's test? Shafay's test is when you're doing complex linear contrast statements. So when you're comparing multiple groups to multiple groups in that two two way comparison manner. And usually only when we're doing two or more linear contrasts. Usually. Okay, let's see. Our student view. No. Where does it say student view? Um, oh, I have to go to home. That's why. Aren't I? Yeah, there we go. Student view. Um, no assignments. Okay. This is assignment 13. Okay. I can make my ah! <laughs> trying to shrink windows and make things fit. Oh. Oh, that didn't help. Can I get your pictures back now? There, I can see you. I can see my screen too. Lovely. Okay. So here we have 240 students and a lot. What does this sound familiar? 240 students. A lot of these these questions are taking from last chapter 12 and now in chapter 12 we tested if there was a difference in chapter 13 we're trying to see where the differences are so 240 students in a large intro site class scored on their introversion scale and divided based on if they're sitting in the middle front or back of the classroom so we did the f test on this for chapter 12 and it said there was a difference so now we want to find where, which groups are different, front, middle, back. So here's our formula for mean squared within, and here's our T formula, our generic T formula. So the first thing we need is mean squared error or mean squared within group. And what does the formula tell us to do? Square our standard deviations to make them S squareds add them up and divide by K. What's K in this case? The size of the groups. K is oh, the group. groups, three. Okay. What is 80? K, no, no. 80 is the little n, group size. Okay. And 
Anyone fast on the calculator? 111 so, squared plus 12 squared plus 13.5 squared. Can I just ask you a quick question? Because I yeah. keep getting confused with these, like, uh, some formulas. Mm -hmm. So the K up top is, means, like, the number of groups. I equals 1. What does that mean? So I is our index. We're going to index from 1, and we're going to count until we get to the top number, which is K is 3. So we're going to start with 1. We're going to go 1, 2, 3, stop. And that's what we're going to plug in for the I. So after that sigma, it says S squared, and the S has a little I on it. So that means we do S1 squared, and then we do S2 squared, and then S3 squared. Uh, okay. Okay, so we're going 1 through K. 1 through K. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So 1 through 3. For 1 through 3, do the S of that number squared. So okay, S so we're just doing... So basically just S squared for each group. And add it up. Divided just, by three. Yeah, so we gotta make sure to add them all up and then divide by three. Yep. Got it. When you get it, let me know and shout it out and we'll see if you can second it and we'll put it in our answer box. I think it's 150.56. Let's see, let's go to four decimal places. Oh, 150.5633. Yep, it says in purple, because these are in oh. steps. We're going to go to four decimal places. So that's our mean squared error, or the mean squared within group. Now to do the t value, we're going to divide by the square root of twice that number divided by square root of n. So let's do twice the mean squared within divided by n. Now what's little n? The number in each group. The number in each group. What value is that here? 80. 80. So now we're going to move to the second formula box and we're going to go 2 times 150.5633 divide by 80 and then square root. <laughs> One point nine four zero one. Can anyone second that? Yep, that's what I got. Okay, I can't hardly get this all on one screen. Okay, so now we're how many pairs, how many groups do we have? One, two, three, front, middle, back. We have three groups. So how many pairings do we have? Front versus middle, front versus back, middle versus back. We have three pairings. For each of those pairings, let's find the difference in the averages. So front versus middle. In front, the average is 28.7. In the middle, the average is 34.3. What do we get when we subtract those? Negative 5.6 or 5.6. We're going to put in the positive value because order changes whether it's positive or negative, but I ask you just to put positive values in. Is there not a check? An oh, the check answer button's all the way down there. Ooh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Now let's go to the next one. Front versus back. Front averages 28.7, back averages 37.2, the difference is 2.9. No. No. Did anyone else get 2.9? I got something different. Oh, front and back, sorry. Is that one 8.5? 8.5, yeah. Yeah, 8.5. And then middle versus back. 2.9. 2.9. There we go. Okay, so those are the differences. So to find our t score for the pairing, we take subtract the averages, that's what we just did, and now we're going to divide by that square root of double the mean squared error over n. So we're going to take each of those difference values and divide by 1.9401.
So what's the X bar J? That's just the second mean that we're. Yeah, I and J are just different number, the numbers. We just, we didn't make them both I because that would make us think that they were the same. Right. So we I and J just so that they're different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Good questions. So our first pairing is different by 5.6. The averages are 5.6 apart. So we divide by that denominator, 1.9401. What do we get for the T score to two decimal places? Uh, 2.89. 2.89, can someone second that? Yeah, how many, oh. Let's do front to back. Our actual averages differed by eight and a half. Now we're going to divide that by that denominator. Square root of double mean squared within over n. Four point three eight. Four point three eight. Yeah, got some thumbs up. Middle to back. 1.49. 1.49. We got a second. Good. Brian's got it. Awesome. So that's how we get the T scores for each of the pairings. Now to decide if they're statistically significant, we need a critical value to compare it to. The critical value is based on the mean degrees of freedom within. Degrees of freedom within, does someone remember? Oh, here it is. The formula is total sample size minus K. What's our total sample size? So that would be 240. So 237. So it'd be 237. Now I hit put here, enter the degrees of freedom you should use. And I said that because there is not a line for 237 on our T chart. Let's go to our T chart, our table. Here's our T chart, right? So we're supposed to go down to degrees of freedom of 237, but what happens at the bottom of our T table? Infinity. Infinity. So we should be looking up 237 degrees of freedom, but which line are we gonna go with? Infinity. Let's go with the infinity line. Are we doing two tails or one tail? Two. Two, did it say that or do we just imply that? Imply. Implied, if it doesn't say otherwise, do two. What is our alpha level going to be? 0 0.05. 0 0.05, because it did say that, right? So we're going to come down that column. So what's our critical value? 0.96. Can I see that? It's kind of small. Yeah, 1.960. 1.96. So how do we put, oh. Oh, so we do put in the 237. We don't put it in. Yeah, it said enter the degrees of freedom you should use. Okay, not that you do use. Because I didn't want to have to have you guys like type an infinity in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't know where that symbol is. Okay, cool. Okay. So here's our three pairings, and here's our three differences and three T values, and here's the critical value we're supposed to use to determine statistical significance. What conclusions can we make? Can we say students in the front are less introverted than those who sit in the middle? Yes. Why, Melissa? Because the critical value was 1.96 and our T value was higher than that, it was 2.89. Yeah, for front versus middle, our T value was bigger than our critical value. So yes, yeah. we can do that. And it's a select all that applies, so we'll keep going. Can we, can we say students sitting in the front are less introverted than those sitting in the back? Front yep. versus back. Mm -hmm. Again, our T value is bigger than our critical value. What about the middle versus the back? Our T value is 1.47. It didn't reach our critical value of 1.96. So we cannot say this last one.
Okay, I will let you do number four. It just changes the standard errors to see what happens. But same process. And number five, it just has cuts the sample size in four and does the same thing. But Sarah, I'm getting an error in five. On five? But, yeah, the, uh, down to the MSE. Uh-huh. That, I've got the, the uh, everything else correct. So I'm so confused as to why my MSE is not right. Because I don't know how you can get the T pair number right if your MSE. That's an answer key mistake then. You're right. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, what the crap am I doing? <laughs> so this is 12 or 13. 13A number five, the mean squared error should equal 150.5633. That's what it should be. Really, that should be it, right? What? What? No, it shouldn't. No, no, no. Because no, it's got to be 602.2533. Because you're you're cu cutting the sample size. Sample in size is not in mean squared within. But did, isn't it keep the same stand? Yeah, oh. it kept the same standard deviation. Sorry, I said the wrong thing. It kept the same standard deviation from number four. It should have kept the same standard deviations from the original one. <gasps> did I not? No, it didn't. I didn't. Okay. Leave student view. Let me fix this. I'm so glad you caught that. But using 602.25, I'm still getting the right T value. Okay, let me get into the answer key and fix it for you guys. Because that should not be. Um, out of the way. So on this one, number five, we should keep the original standard deviations. Okay. This one should is be a little bit. for number four? Oh, no, number five. four is doubled. So this one should be 11.2. This one should be 12.0. And this one should be 13.5. Oh. Yes, that's the problem. And then then it should work. Well, I put it in. Oh, it was yellow, which means it was right, but okay. Okay, that should work. Let me save that. Maybe we should do that one really quick. We should do that. So the mean squared is mean squared error is 150.5633 because we already did it on the part. We already did that. Right. And so the denominator will be different because we're dividing by n of 20, not n of 80. So we would do double the 150.5633 but divided by 20 and then square root. So we get, who has fast calculator? Sorry, I was muted. I got 3.8802, is that not right? That's what I got. Oh, okay, phew. Now the mean differences, how different the means are, this is going to be the same as it was before because we didn't change the means. The means stayed the same values. So what did we say they were? Um, 5.6 and 8.5. 8.5 and the last one was 2.9. But to calculate the T value, we're now going to divide by this new denominator.
Does anyone want to check these? Or are you good? So the mean differences for number five will be the same as. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't change, we didn't mess with the averages. And to find the mean differences, you just subtract averages. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first one is 1.44. 1.44, yep. Second one's three, I mean 2.19. 0.19. Are those numbers just tiny on your screens? <laughs> Depends on how big your monitor is. Is it little or is it big? Are you on the laptop or a big desktop? <laughs> Last one is 0 0.75, did I do that right? Yep. So compared to the beginning, what happened to our T values? Looks like they're cut in half. Yeah, they look like they're cut in half. They're cut in half. So which one is that? Divide by two? Yep. on the teacher view. So let's go here. The next one I did want to look at together. Um, because you can keep... not working for me. Huh? I can't do this one. I need you. So yes, please. Okay. <laughs> let's do Fisher's LSD and Tukey's HSD corrections and confidence intervals. Okay. So here we want to know, is methyl, mental arithmetic affected by drugs? So we saw this problem last time too. We have the four different drugs that they're taking, and we've got the means and the standard deviations. We've got 32 subjects total, so eight in each group. So here are the steps to do Fisher's LSD. First, we need to know little n. What's little n? 32. Nope, little n, wait. Eight. The 32 eight. subjects were divided into the four groups. So little n oh. is? Eight. Eight. And T is 32. Uh-huh. Get a little bigger. And then now we need our T critical value. This is where we look it up in our table. The degrees of freedom that we need to look up are the 28. When we look up the critical value, it's degrees of freedom within, which is NT minus k which is four so let's see so degrees of freedom 28 there's the 28 line and we need to look up it says what did it say alpha to use Point five. and these are all two-tailed tests all, these, unless it's the line, you're always going to do two tails yep two tails so our critical value is 2.048. Okay. Now we need mean squared within. We found this way back on homework 12, number seven. In fact, I told it to you because I didn't want us to be number crunching for so long. It was 10.1089. Do you remember that number now? Does that ring a bell? And you could find it by squaring all the standard deviations, adding them up and dividing by four. But yeah, we won't go. Oh. Now we do Fisher's LSD. So this formula box right up here. So we're gonna take our T critical value and we're gonna times it by the square root of two times the mean squared error over N. Ugh. So let's start in the inside. So we're gonna, let's start at the top of the fraction. Two times the mean squared within so two times the 10.1089. And we're gonna divide it by eight. what number? Eight. eight. Then we're gonna square root it. And then we're gonna times it by this critical value we just looked up. Okay. 
shout it out when you get there. Three point two six. Three point two six. That's correct. This tells us that if two groups have to have averages this far apart to be statistically significant. This is the least amount groups can be separated by in the averages to be considered statistically significantly different. So if we look up here, marijuana had an average of seven, amphetamines had an average of eight. How different are those averages? One, is that that far apart? No, one is not 3.26 apart. So it's those two averages, marijuana and amphetamines, are not different. But what about amphetamines and alcohol? How far, far apart are those averages? Eight and four. How far apart are they? Eight take away four, they're four apart. Is that statistically significant? Yes. Because yes, they're over 3.26 apart. So Fisher's LSD gives you a measuring stick to say they've got to be at least this far apart to be different. If they're closer than that amount, then we can't say they're different. That's the least significant difference. LSD, least significant difference. It's the least amount they can be apart and still be different. And then Tukey, he was a smart aleck and he's calling his honestly significantly different. Because you need to be honest. And he didn't think Fisher was doing it right. So to do this one, we have to calculate the components. First, we've got to do this Q value. And when you, we're going to enter what degrees of freedom you should look up on the table, not the true value. So when we do a Q value, the first number is not degrees of freedom. The first number is the number of groups. And how many groups do we have? Four. And the second number is the degrees of freedom within. And the formula was up here. What was the total sample size minus K? We already figured out that that's 28. 28. So we need to go to the Q table to 4 and 28. So it's A11. I'm going to turn mine around. There it is. So we're going to look up four, four column number four, because we have four groups, and we have 28 degrees of freedom. Now, 28 is not on here. So what's the closest? Should we go with 30 or should we go with 24? 30. We go with 30 and four groups. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I think I might be on the wrong page. No, I'm on the right page. Yeah. Uh, let's be conservative and, and go with 24. Let's go conservative. So even though 30 is closer, we're going to be conservative and just go with 24. So, so we put 24 in the, on the homework? Yes, yeah, it's because it says put the degrees of freedom you actually looked up, not what it should be. Right. And that was 3.90. So Tukey's HSD formula is a little bit different. We don't times the mean squared error by two. We just take it and divide by n. What was n? Eight. So we're going to take our 10.1089, divide by eight, square root it, and times by 3.9. And I'm not getting that answer to work in the answer key. What did you get? 4.33. Um, I got point, point, 4.38 written down. Well, I've got both of them written down. I've got one scratched out. I got point 0.38 as well. So I they, three, and, two. the answer in the back of the book is something totally different. They used a critical value in the back of the book of 3.87 that doesn't even exist on the table. I know. They did linear interpolation. Aren't they oh, fun? Right. Okay. 28, it says 3.9. If you look up 24, it says 3.87. So they like split the difference. Mm, that's what Back they did. The book is just, you know, all kinds of fun. So if you use 3, 
that should work. It should be 4.38. Right. Totally agree. There we go. Okay. Beautiful. So according to Fisher's ruler, groups have to be 3.26 apart to be significantly different. Tukey's um, formula says to be different, they have to be 4.38 apart. Are they close to the same number? Yeah. Which one's more strict? Tukey's. Tukey's is always going to be a bigger, Tukey's HSD will always be a bigger number than Fisher's LSD because it has a bigger requirement. So now the next one is asking you to do confidence intervals, but because the order you subtract in can make a difference, we made them drag and drop. <laughs> so the first one is Valium and alcohol. So if we look up at our table, Valium and alcohol, how different apart are their averages? Five and four. We subtract and we get one. one. So one plus or minus 4.38. Oh, and now these are three threes because they are, they were using the other number. Let me fix those. In preview. Okay, so amphetamines and oh, amph oh, did it randomize the order? Yeah, or it looks different than mine. Yeah, and this is different than the last time it was Valium and alcohol at the top. Oh, everybody's in different order. Lovely. Let's do the Valium and alcohol since I was looking at that one before. That's on the bottom of my list now. Who knows where it's in your list? Valium and alcohol. Their averages are one apart, but we're going to plus or minus Tukey's HSD of 4.38. So if we subtract it, we'll get negative 3.38. And if we add it, we'll get positive 5.38. Well, what if we subtract in the other order? There another one you guys want to do? Yeah. Which one um, to do the um, conclusions? Do they need to be in APA or how, how do how do they do APA? I don't know. I didn't see a slide where APA was on the multiple comparisons. Um, usually when we do multiple comparisons, um, so we do, usually we say everything we said before in chapter 12, and we say the ANOVA found evidence of, that at least one group was different. Post hoc pairwise testing showed that, and then you say which groups were significantly different. And for each pair, you have to put the, usually we put the T with the degrees of freedom and the P value. And you have, usually you, you just say which method of adjustment was used. Using Fisher's LST, and then put the adjusted p-values. So these don't say, um, let's see. Let's, let's do one of them that uses R, shall we? Which one uses R? Um, let's do, well, where's the slide one? Let's go to the slide one. I don't want to do the homework for you so you don't have any. any Oh, well, I think we're fine with that. <laughs> I know you think you are, but <laughs> I want you to have the practice. Okay, so if I was doing this problem, this was in our example problem class, it had three groups. So which method is preferred in the three group scenario? Bonferroni, Tukey, or Fishy? F fishies, Fishers. Three groups? 
fissures. Mm -hmm. So after we say that the ANOVA found evidence of at least one group was different, then you say using Fisher's LSD adjustment on all possible pairwise tests, it was found that the no music group significantly differed from classical T with 12 degrees of freedom equals 2.98 comma P equals 0 0.11100. Here, should I get a little? Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in open word. So I can type instead of just talk. So if I put that there. Okay, let's make big, big letters. Um, post hoc pairwise T tests using Fisher's. And usually we would say which adjustment method we're going to use in the method section. That's a method's choice, right? So we say the methodol methodological choice in the method section, and then we just report the p-values in the results section. I think, I think it's the next chapter I actually have you read a journal article that has some of these um, reported. Is it this, this chap next chapter? It's coming up. It's coming up. Fisher's LSD. Yeah, how's talking? Post hoc. Adjustment. Uh, found that the no, the found that participants who memorized the words in quiet and we would want to say direction so we don't just say it's different we say memorized more words than those listening to classical music <laughs> And that's where we would say our T and our P and so the quiet memorized more than the classical or the rock. Uh, there was no evidence of a different the difference between the two music types. Six, five, five. So you've got to have all of the T values and P values, one for each pair somehow in there with the words to tell which groups were the same and which ones were different. And if they're different, you should say who was higher or who was lower. Just like when we had pairwise T tests, we did a independent pairs T test before. Trying to look through the homework and see if I can find any that I think might cause a little stumble. 
Has anyone tried any of them that might stumble? Kimberly, you are, seem like you'd tried them out before. Oh, I got stuck and had to quit at the queue. <laughs> I was like, I can't stress out about this anymore. I got to ask you. <laughs> Don't stress out about this class. If you get stuck, you email me and see if you can come to office hours tomorrow. Yes, don't don't get an ulcer over this, please. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, I could not figure out why they picked four, 3.87. I mean, I don't know why that tripped me up so bad, but it was stressing me out from the back of the book. I'm like, that's I know. In right. the back of the book, it drives me crazy because sometimes they round down and sometimes they round up and then randomly they interpolate. Right. <laughs> without telling you. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, how do they, I mean, it's just like randomly crops up. It makes me wonder, I'm sure that Barry Cohen just had grad students. Okay, you grad student, you do this chapter, you do that chapter, and they were just weren't a cohesive. It's not wrong. That's what, you know, a table with more decimal places would do. And a computer would find the exact value. So it's not wrong, it's just not consistent. <laughs> which I like consistent. When it just say, what is the conclusion? You don't have to put it in APA with the T and the P values. You can just tell me which group's higher than what other group or which ones are the same as which other ones. It's only when it's APA that you have to put in the, the statsy numbers. Which number was the APA one? Sorry. Um, not this one. I don't think it's until chapter or section C. In section C, they ask you to do APA, I believe. I believe, maybe not. I don't think it does. Oh. So the one you just typed up was just an example? An example of how you would write it APA. Okay. Mm-hmm. Got it. So we did it with eight subjects per group. And then the next one says, what if instead you'd had 16 per group? How does that change it? I think on the next one, if I'm not mistaken, on eight, just to give you a heads up, on eight, um, it does Fisher's LSD and Tukey's HSD, and then, and you mark which groups are different. And then down here at the part C, it asks you to do the modified LSD. Let's do this one together because it's a slightly different formula. And again, it's because Fisher's can sometimes be too lenient and Tukey's can sometimes be more stringent. And so there's this modified LSD to be in the middle. Um, I personally haven't used it, but we can go ahead and do it. Um, first we need to calculate, so this is what item? Is it item three, 13B8? So we'll skip down here. Um, oh, I guess we should see what the problem's about. So this is about five different antidepressants. So we have five groups, one for each of the types of drugs. Um, and here we have 15 subjects in each group. And we're gonna assume that we have all of them, that there's no missing data. So we have five groups of 15. So what's the denominators between groups? The little yellow box is up here to help us. Okay. 
Four. Four. Five groups, degrees of freedom between is four. And then what's the within groups? We have five groups of 15. 75 minus 5, 70? 70. That's right. Total sample size, 15 times 5, and then take away 5. And so when we look up Q, what values are we going to look up for Q? Five groups. Remember with Q, you do number of groups and then degrees of freedom within. Now, if we go to the Q table though, there's not a line for 70. So which line are we gonna look up? 60. 60, so our Q value is 3.98. And let's put 60, the actual number we looked up. I think that's, oh. I need to fix that. Oh, 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 oh. It says look at page 424 on the textbook. I, I remember this now. This is a funky one. Um, yeah, you have your book handy. You want to have a paper book? What page was it? 424. I've got it open. Yeah, so when you look up the Q value, instead of using five groups, you use degrees of freedom between, right? Uh, it says use book page what? 424. Four. At the bottom of 424, it talks about the modified LSD, Fisher Heiter test. It says so, K minus one. So we use K minus one instead. So this should be four instead of the usual five. So our, it's not 3.98, it's 3.74. It's been a while since I did that one. And so that's the Q value that we times the square root of MSE over N. And MSE we do up above and then N is 15. So we had 15 per group. So we have 3.74 is the Q value. Right. And then the MSW. You have to go back up here. We had five groups of 15 for a total of 75. So we need to do, how do we get mean squared error, mean squared within? Where all the SDs, add them up divide by five. Take all so, your square. N your is five or 15? Hmm? N is five or 15? Oh, 15. You're right. 15 per group. K is five. Yeah. You'll have to take all your SDs, square them, add them up, divide by five to get mean squared error. Say that one more time. Take all of the standard deviations. Okay, square them. Square them, add them up, divide by five since there's five of them. Oh, okay. I'm getting 36.546 if someone's got that. I did not get that. Oh, goody. I must have checked something <laughs> wrong. Oh, I, I see what I did wrong. Divide by n? By five, five groups. Does 42.546 sound better? Or am I still wrong? Yep. 42.5460 is what I got.
so that's the MS within, mean squared within, that goes down here in this formula. It was 42.54? Six, zero. Because four decimal places. Okay. If you can just get through these, just these few section A and B questions, you'll never have to do this by hand again. But I want you to know that these values are real values. They're not just coming out of thin air. N is 15. N is 15. Okay. So is it 6.70? For the two keys? Oh, for sorry, going back to Fisher's. What's I that? got, for two keys, I got 6.52. How did you do that? Um, Tell me what values you typed in. Okay, for the MSW, I got 45.5460. No, so it's 52.54, right? Oh, there's my problem, I think. A reversal? Yeah. Yeah, that's me. And that's times by 3.74, right? After you square root it. Um, what's the Q value? This Q value for regular two keys, we look up five and 60. Well, it should be 70, but we're gonna put what we looked up in the table. Oh, maybe I'm on a different section than you. In part A, you're doing two keys, HSD, and so the first number, first degree of freedom is number of groups five. It's on part C, that when we're doing the modified fissures that we use groups minus one, four. Oh, and I think that's why I was getting the difference because I was down below. Okay. So down below to do this modified fissures, you do, you're using 3.74 for your Q value. Yeah. So what did you get here? I got 6.52. Is but, that after you changed your mean squared error to 40? No, that's what I've got to change now. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out, let's see, uh, on two keys, the formula for HSD mm -hmm. and then down below the modified LSD, they look exactly the same. The difference is the Q value. When you do the modified LSD, when you look up the Q, the first number should be K minus one versus when you do a regular HSD, it's just five groups. Oh, okay. So that Q number is different. That's the only part that's different is oh. hey, can, how you look up the Q value. Can we start at the top? I'm thinking I was working on a different area. Getting them crossed so. That's um, what I'm worried about. Okay, so you... here's the top. This is part A. Point. 15 per group of five for a total of 75, mean squared within. Yeah. Okay. When we look up, our degrees of freedom are five and 70, but we really look up 60. Okay. And then I can figure that out. Now can we look down at section C? I'm just trying to make sure I wasn't writing them in the wrong section area. Section C, instead of, when you look up Q, instead of doing five groups, we do degrees of freedom within or between four. Oh yeah. So we move over a column in the Q table. And I got 6.30 for that answer. Yep. Okay. I just had one of the numbers in the wrong kind place. Crossed over, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you guys, we're out of time. 
That went by fast. Can you believe how fast it went? You got a good start on the homework though. Get your Thank feet you for your help. Yeah, definitely. So um, I want you to focus more. I mean, you've got to dredge through a couple of these by hand, but starting in section C, most of them are with R, not by hand. And so it's more on the meaning. There's three of them in section C, one, two, and four. So tomorrow we'll have office hours at seven. Um, if you guys need office hours again on Friday, email me and we can set something up, preferably for the morning-ish hours. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So you guys are doing great. You're going to make it. I mean, really, the next chapter when we... The only thing we're going to add in the next chapter is instead of one-way ANOVA, they're two-way ANOVA. So instead of one grouping variable, we have two grouping variable. And the complexity is interactions. You can get over interactions, the rest of the class starts to taper off as far as difficulty level. So we're really getting on. Next class will be the pinnacle as far as difficulty in this class. Last chapter 12 was probably the heaviness of hand calculations. But the ideas of an interaction are like the major big idea left in this class. So you'll make it, you're getting there. Okay. All right, I'll get this processing and get it up on YouTube. Okay, bye. All right, thanks. Bye.